if I was to ask you what high performance means, what would you say? What are the examples of high performing individuals that you would cite? Maybe an impactful historical figure like Leonardo da Vinci. Maybe your favorite sports team or somebody that motivates you. When I think about this question myself, I think about what shaped me growing up. I think about the story of my family and their journey to this country. From the townships of Gujarat in India, across the Indian Ocean to Madagascar. From there, uprooted through to Kenya and Uganda, and uprooted again and dropped into the factories and the warehouses of the Midlands, where tough hands were forged and their spirits cast in iron. This is one of my favorite photos. It's of my grandma working in a hosiery factory some 50 years ago in Leicester. Now, let's be honest, we all know it's our grandmothers that are the real, true high performance. I also think about this man, Muhammad Ali, someone who needs no introduction. I discovered him in my teenage years after reading his autobiography at the age of 13, The Soul of a Butterfly. He fundamentally reprogrammed the way that I think, giving me an infallible sense that there really was nothing that I couldn't do. I would walk to school every day with my headphones in, listening to his speeches and his interviews over and over again. And I embedded his way of thinking into my life immediately. This is a cover page of an application form that I had to fill out when I was 14 years old in high school. I was supposed to fill out this form to decide my area of interest or my work experience I was going to be doing the following year. On the reverse of this page was a list of options of different types of jobs, and I was supposed to select one that was of interest. But I didn't like any of them. So what I did is I drew an extension to the box, I wrote down my own option, and I cycled it and handed the form. <laughs> As you can see from the sticky note on the cover page, uh, the careers advisor wasn't too happy. And she wrote down, you cannot add your own choice. <laughs> now, I'm not here to criticize the careers advisor. I was being pretty disruptive. But in my mind, I was programmed differently. Not only could I choose whatever I wanted, but whatever I choose, I knew that I could be great at it. However, the more that I embedded this way of thinking, the more that I realized it wasn't most people's default position, especially as we get older. Fast forward a few years, and I'm in my final year at university, and everyone around me is receiving their acceptance letters from all of the graduate teams that they've been applying for. Deep down inside, I knew that wasn't for me. It isn't what I wanted to do. So instead, what I did was withdrew from all of the application processes and all the interview processes that I was engaged in, and I took a trip to Uganda, where my dad was born. I found myself in a rural area in the Bolisa district, near the border with the Congo, building a primary school. I also got to visit the old town where my dad was born and met some people that knew him from over 60 years ago. After that, I returned back to the UK with hardly any money left in my bank account. And I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I wasn't worried at all because of the mindset that I cultivated. So I ended up leaving again. And that second picture is of me traveling to Kenya straight afterwards, within a month. I spent three months in Kenya working with entrepreneurs helping them to build, scale, and innovate their businesses, as well as pitch for investment. These two trips were really impactful for me, not only because they were an opportunity for me to do something meaningful, but also because they were a springboard for me to demonstrate what I was capable of with the mentality that I cultivated. Since then, I've been on a bit of a rocket ship. I've spent the last 10 years building businesses like Uber, as well as supporting and advising entrepreneurs around the world. And when I think about what's got me to where I am today, there are really three core principles that I've been applying consistently throughout my life. So whether I'm digging a trench in Uganda, or I'm helping my team launch a product, or I'm pitching for an eight-figure investment, there are three things I always do and that I always hold in my head, and I'd like to share those with you today. Those are, number one, efficacy of focus. Number two, a dutiful mindset. Number three, forced improvement. Let's start with the first one, efficacy of focus, which is all about aligning your efforts and the inputs that you're creating to the outcomes that you want to deliver. We live in a world full of distractions. We have mobile phones in our hands 24 hours a day, programmed with apps that hold our addiction. Endless emails, lists, to do, lists of things to do, people messaging us, all supposedly important things that we should be paying attention to. As a result, one of the biggest challenges that we all have is knowing how to control and deploy our focus effectively. 
Your focuses drive the inputs of your life, which ultimately are going to determine the outcomes. As Epictetus, the great Stoic philosopher, once said, you become what you give your attention to. When building technology, our attention is on building what we call core product value. Core product value is what will differentiate what we're creating from what's already out there and speaks to the person that we're building for. When doing so, my objective is to get as clear as possible on everything that I need to do to focus on building core product value and nothing else. This enables me to know all of the things I should be paying attention to, as well as all the things that I shouldn't be paying attention to. And I'm sure that this is shared with my team. This simple act of constantly questioning how the deployment of your inputs and your efforts are laddering up to the outcomes that you want to deliver is a really important practice to implement, but it's one that is often overlooked. In addition to assembling the right inputs, you need to deploy them in the right sequence along a critical path. This is also really important because it's easy to fall for what I call the busy trap, where feeling busy feels productive. But this is a trick because sometimes be, being busy is not, is not necessarily mean that you're being productive and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're correctly focused because the feeling is always the same irrespective of the situation. Additionally, another thing that I really try to do is ensure that delivering the outcome takes precedence over my own personal utility. What is personal utility? Well, it's defined by economists as being the degree of pleasure or satisfaction that an individual receives from an economic act. Human beings are by nature utility maximizing agents. That means that we choose between two options based on each option, option's respective utility that it can provide us. The problem, however, with this natural tendency is it can muddy the waters of our focus and can also build up our ego. There are two ways that you can prevent this. Firstly, recognize that sometimes the best input or level of effort that you need to put in doesn't necessarily involve you, despite you wanting all the glory. In a team setting, this means constantly questioning whether or not you can, there's a better way of doing something, even if it means handing it over to somebody else. Secondly, accepting that whatever you're trying to do is more often than not something that someone, someone else has already tried. And whether or not they failed or succeeded, the fact of the matter is, most problems are not new and most ideas are not original. So what you should be doing is be willing to ask simple questions, invest in understanding what's been done before you, and then build from there. Ultimately, however, putting these two things aside, if you want to completely avoid the urge of personal utility, you need a fundamental mental shift to replace it with something else. And this neatly brings me on to my second principle, having a dutiful mindset. We're surrounded by prompts that make us focus on ourselves. We get dopamine hits from the likes and followers that we have on social media or how many people have viewed our Instagram story. This can make us think in a very individualistic way. And sometimes this inward focus is bad mental programming for high performance. In my mind, the most beneficial thing we can all do to have the biggest impact is in fact the complete opposite. If you instead primarily focus outwards on the measurable value that you're delivering, not what you're personally getting in return, you can make your personal utility be all about the act of creating value for others. I call this being a net contributor. Another way of thinking about it is you shift from being in a consuming mindset to being in a creating mindset. Or in the technology world, what we call building real value, not just perceived value. So what is your daily practice to enable you to do this? Well, the simplest way I've found is to ask, the, ask myself and others around me as often as possible, what more can I do to create value? as opposed to asking, what can I do to receive more? Which is typically how our natural instincts ask us to do. I try to see my purpose as being primarily concerned with a focus on duty to service, and holding this mindset is my antidote to the lure of inwardly focused personal utility. The way I also practically live this myself is that in addition to being an enthusiastic company builder, I do my best in playing a role to ensure the issues of disparity being addressed through the application of the technology that we're building. I measure my value creation as not only being about how much top line revenue or profit that I can generate, but equally as much about ensuring that we're making the right decisions for people, measuring the social impact of how technology is being experienced, adopted, and disseminated through the world. This approach has actually enabled me to help establish a social impact team. Now in its sixth year at one of the world's largest technology companies, where I invest in delivering measurable so outcomes for solving social issues. Thinking this way yourself is what will help you apply your own personal value system to your work, something that many people often struggle to do. 
Now, one thing that's for sure is that applying this mindset can be a challenge. But having the tools to live our values and share them with the world is a very worthy mountain to climb. And that's where principle number three, forced improvement, comes into play. Doing easy things doesn't lead to outside results. Where you are today is a result of you layering on the thousands of instances you did something for the first time and found it difficult. Through the general course of your life, you know that you will inevitably face discomfort and adversity. And as you know, naturally, your instincts pull you away from that discomfort and adversity towards what's certain, what's comfortable, and what's familiar. But I'd argue, not only should we expect adversity and discomfort in our lives, but weirdly, we should go out and find it. We should proactively seek discomfort. There's a simple concept, which is a really great metaphor for this. It's the idea of your cycle of competency. And this is something that I like to visualize when I'm about to do something really challenging. Within your circle of competency is everything that's familiar to you, everything that's comfortable, everything that you're good at, everything that you're confident at. And when you get to the edge of that circle and you look out into the unknown, things get really scary. But the great thing is that every time you choose to bump up to the edge of your circle, you push it out just a little further. I often find myself in rooms full of people that are way smarter than me. And as time goes on, those rooms get smarter and smarter. But I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the fact that I always take the decision to step into the room, no matter who's in there. I step over the boundary line of my cycle as often as possible, operating in discomfort and continually expanding my competencies. Now doing this also has a bonus effect because it increases your capacity for work as more and more things get easier for you. But there's another real reason why this is really necessary for your long-term success. And that's because the rate at which your circle expands is determined by you and the level of effort you're willing to put in. But the arena in which you're operating is also changing and forever expanding and growing. These could be changes in your industry, new technologies, new novel ways of doing things. And although much of what we've spoken about today has been about operational effectiveness, this alone is not going to differentiate what you're doing, nor enable you to create maximum value. It's only through exploring this larger circle that you will. Michael E. Porter, a famous strategist, has one of my favorite pieces of writing entitled, Operational Effectiveness is Not Strategy. You need to broaden your capabilities as well as improving at all the things that you're currently good at. Constantly moving out into the space of the unknown as quickly as possible will not only keep you from going stale, but it will give you the best chance of finding what most people are not even looking for. I'm going to leave you now with a phrase that I've known or frequently saying with my team and everyone around me that I work with. It really underpins everything that I do, and it has a direct thread back all the way to the reprogramming of my mind when I was 13 years old by Muhammad Ali. When I'm faced with an insurmountably difficult problem, one that other people are scared of, people that say you can't do or they say is impossible, my starting point is always to simply say, we'll find a way. You might have zero understanding of what it's going to take to deliver the result. You might not even know whether you have the skills to do it or where you're going to even find those skills. But I always say on day one, we'll find a way. That's because with efficacy of focus on the desired outcome, you can identify the optimal inputs that you're going to need to deliver the result. And once you have those inputs, you just need to focus on figuring out how to sequence them along a critical path and then build a plan to execute on that. With a dutiful mind concerned with creating maximum value, your attention is focused on the task at hand and nothing else. And this gives you unparalleled efficiency and the power to live your values through your work. And finally, through forced improvement and the act of continually proactively seeking discomfort, you're operating at the precipice of your own potential, constantly pushing out the boundary line of your circle of competence. And I'm here to say to you today that if you layer all of these three things all at once, you give yourself a high performance edge that means what may seem insurmountable and impossible to some will be to you just another day. Thank you.